The Kingdom of Iraq, a retrospect. The events which took place in Baghdad on the 14th of July 1958 were received by the world with a shock of horror and incredulity. For years, respectable journalists, enthusiastic statesmen and even sedate academics, exhausting the vocabulary of praise and admiration, have been expatiating on the stability of Iraq, on the wisdom and honesty of its rulers, and their provident management of the immense wealth which oil royalties had brought to the country. Here and there, it is true, voices were raised to protest that Iraq under Nuri al-Sayed was a police state, a hotbed of corrupt and greedy reactionaries who were oppressing the people and betraying its national aspirations, but such rumours were dismissed, and perhaps rightly, as the expression of Egyptian malevolence, or as the scandal-mongering of ignorant left-wing journalists. To foresee such a revolution would have required, of course, divinatory powers. Is it not significant, nevertheless, that public information on Iraq was so poor, that intimations of coming trouble should emulate only from sources which it was natural and reasonable to discount and discredit? The unexpected character of the revolution was not, however, the only reason for the shock it produced. There was also the murder at dawn of the royal family, of the king, an innocent and harmless young man of 24, of his aged grandmother, of his devoted aunt, and other inmates of the royal palace. It was not merely the indiscriminate killing which aroused horror, but also that a king and his family were the victims, for an obscure and tenacious instinct has always moved men to consider regicide peculiarly heinous and impious. A king is the head of the state, and the state, however mean and perverted, has still something in nobility. It is an invention peculiar to man, a dyke against bestiality and a storehouse of devotion and loyalty. To lay violent hands on it is to weaken the social fabric, to increase human insecurity and to let loose evil and destructive passions. But everything considered, was there not reason to expect some such upheaval and is there not reason even now to expect further, perhaps even more violent commotions? For brief as it is, the record of the Kingdom of Iraq is full of bloodshed, treason and rapine, and however pitiful its end, we may now say that this was implicit in the beginning. Let us briefly examine this record. In 1933, the kingdom inaugurated its full independence by a massacre of the Assyrians carried out by the Iraqi army. At the beginning of 1935, the threat of tribal unrest in the Euphrates area forced the ministry of Ali Jordat al Ayyubi to resign. He was followed in March by Jamil al Midfai, who, after a fortnight in power, also resigned under the threat of a tribal uprising. He, in turn, was followed by Yassin al-Hashimi, whose ministry lasted until October 1936. Under this ministry, the tribes of Rumaitha in the Diwaniya province rose in rebellion in May 1935. Martial law was declared, and the army, helped by aerial and ground bombing, put down the revolt. At the same time, the tribes of Suk al shayuk and Nasiria in the Muntafik province also rose and had to be put down by the army. In the summer of the same year, the Kurdish tribes of Barzan showed signs of rebellion and the government had again to proclaim martial law and send an army contingent which established order for a time. In the following October, the government sent out a punitive expedition against the Yazidis of Jabal Sinjar, who were objecting to army conscription, put down the opposition and hanged two Christian notables from Mosul, as well as seven Mukhtars of Yazidi villages. The attempt to apply military conscription to the tribes resulted in other outbreaks, of which the most serious was at the Rumaitha in April 1936, which the government, armed as it was with an air force, put down with the utmost severity. The killing, it seems, was indiscriminate, and old men, women and children were the victims of machine gunning and bombing from the air. The Agra tribes in Diwaniya also objected to military conscription and revolted in June of the same year. The revolt was put down and the government hanged and imprisoned their chiefs. At the end of October 1936, General Bakr Sidki, who had directed the operations against the Assyrians and the Euphrates tribes, together with a fellow general, Abd al-Latif Nuri, whom financial embarrassments induced to enter the conspiracy, carried out a coup d'etat against Yassin al-Hashimi, banished him together with Rashid Ali al-Ghalani and Nuri al-Sayed from Iraq, having previously ordered the murder of the latter's brother-in-law, Jafar al-Askari. Bakar put in power a civilian confederate, Hikmat Suleiman. Under this ministry in May 1937, the tribes of Samawa in Diwaniya also rose in revolt, as a result of the agrarian unrest and their objections to military conscription. The revolt was put down with the help of indiscriminate aerial bombing. In August, an army corporal, instigated by his officer, shot and killed Bakar Sidki,
Thereupon, the commander of the Mosul garrison, Muhammad Amin al umari threatened rebellion unless Hikmat resigned office. Hikmat resigned, and Jamil al midfai negotiated with the officers and obtained the succession. His ministry lasted until December 1938, when five colonels in Baghdad, in a conspiracy with Nuri al-Sayyid and Taha al-Hashimi, compelled him to vacate office. Nuri became Prime Minister, and Taha Minister of Defence. Nuri remained in office until February 1940, when dissension broke out between his military supporters, who were divided into two factions. One faction attempted a coup against Nuri, and the other a second coup d'etat in favour of Nuri. They were victorious, and Nuri remained in office until the end of March, when the intrigues of Rashid Ali al Galiani, then chief of the royal cabinet, compelled him to leave office. Nuri's supporters in the army now bestowed their protection on Rashid, who, after the fall of France, felt confident enough to challenge the British government by following a pro German policy. Abd al Ilah, the regent who took the place of King Ghazi, killed in a motor accident in 1939, attempted to dismiss Rashid in January 1941. He was threatened by the colonels and fled to Diwanir. Rashid Ali, faced with the scandal, resigned and was succeeded by Taha al-Hashimi on the 1st of February. Exactly two months later, the colonels extorted Taha's resignation, the regent fled the country and Rashid Ali took power again. He deposed the regent and declared war on Great Britain, but his movement collapsed at the end of May and he fled to Germany, where he spent the rest of the war. The British occupation of Iraq, which followed Rashid Ali's movement, froze the political situation, but no sooner was the war finished than the Kurdish tribes of Barzan rose in revolt. It took two months from August until October 1945 to put down the rebellion. Thereafter, the Kurdish areas were in constant state of effervescence under continuous and vigilant military control. The civilian administration being frequently in the hands of the local military commander, at the beginning of 1948, the Prime Minister Salih Jabba negotiated the Portsmouth Treaty with Great Britain. Her enemies and rivals in Baghdad succeeded in rousing the mob which frightened the region into disowning the Prime Minister. A few months later, Iraq joined the other states of the Arab League in the invasion of Palestine. The enterprise proved ill-judged, futile and disastrous. After the establishment of the State of Israel, the government succeeded during 1950-51 in reducing the prosperous Jewish community by means of intimidation, persecution and confiscatory legislation into a horde of refugees. In 1952, riots broke out in Baghdad, which compelled the government to substitute direct for indirect suffrage. And in the summer of 1958, took place the 14th of July of Abdel Karim Qasim. The spare record of 26 years of independent government is a grim history. When we add that in the 37 years which lie between the accession of 1921 of Faisal I to the throne of Iraq and the murder in 1958 of his grandson Faisal II, 57 ministries took office. We must conclude that such a condition argues a wretched political architecture and constitutional jerry-building of the flimsiest and most dangerous kind. The Kingdom of Iraq was in its origin an emanation of British policy. It was the ingenuity, persistence and devotion of British officials that set up this structure which has been proved so shaky and so impermanent. To understand why it crashed, it is therefore necessary to begin by examining the materials they chose and the methods they employed. The Kingdom which British policy put together in 1921 was built around one man, Faisal, the third son of the Sharif of Mecca, who at the end of the First World War had been installed king in Damascus, from which he was evicted in the summer of 1920 by the French, who had lost patience with his intrigue and vacillation, with the anarchy which his rule promoted and the inimical agitations of his supporters. No sooner was Faisal out of Syria than his friends in Great Britain, of whom the best known was Colonel Lawrence, attempted to install him as king of Iraq. Faisal's character was not unknown to his partisans, and Seven Pillars of Wisdom, Colonel Lawrence called him a weak man, while in the manuscript of his book he had added that he was an empty one as well. But in August 1920, the British ministers asked the French government to consent to Faisal's installation in Iraq. The latter made strenuous objections, and Berthelo, the foreign minister, informed Lloyd George that in his view Faisal was a weak man of very feeble character, of considerable prestige but dangerous. Lloyd George agreed with this estimate, but said that Faisal was wanted by the sheiks of Mesopotamia, and that if the French consented to his candidature, the British government would be able to release 70,000 troops who were engaged in policing the country. Curzon, the foreign secretary, attempted a stouter defence of Faisal's character and of British policy, but privately confessed his doubts and hesitations. We hinted, he wrote to Sir Herbert Samuel on the 15th of August 1920, at Faisal for Mesopotamia, but the French pronounced him a double-dyed traitor, and also screamed with rage. The idea must probably be postponed at least for the moment. 
nor am I quite sure it is sound, for he was clearly weak and was a puppet at Damascus. The doubt was not misplaced, for Faisal in Baghdad soon showed the same unreliable character and used the same devious methods which led to the impatient French to get rid of themselves of his rule in Damascus. The same refrain is heard during the years of his rule in Baghdad. King Faisal, says Sir Henry Dobbs, the High Commissioner to the American Consul in 1923, is not a masterful leader, and he therefore expects trouble after the conclusion of the Turkish Treaty. In the judgment of the Chairman of the League of Nations, Mosul Commission Faisal was a poor creature. I wish, writes Dobbs in 1929, to an official at the Colonial Office, King Faisal were not so chameleon-like. He, was a, he is a very exhausting person to live with, and I think his Prime Ministers all feel the same. Even Miss Bell, his warm partisan, came to confess less than a year after his enthronement that the King was not dependable. Mr Cornwallis and I, she wrote in the letter of the 4th of June 1922, had a long talk, and I told him I was very unhappy over the King's indecisive attitude, his refusal to contradict the statements of the extremist papers and the backing he was giving to the most ignoble extremists. He agreed and said he had fought with him and was bitterly disillusioned. Oh, the king, the king, she exclaims two days later, if only he would be more firm. And a month later, she is bitter about still more evidence of his double dealing. She confronts him with it and after two hours discussion, he embraced me with a great fervency and we parted on the rather unsatisfactory terms of close sentimental union and political divergence. On 31st of August, she is driven to write a Faisal that he is vain and feeble and timid and that his fine ideals can never come to maturity. And some two months later, reporting one of his manoeuvres, she sums up admirably his usual political style as exhibited both in Syria and Mesopotamia and the lack of character which went with it. He wants, she wrote in a letter of 25th of October, to get another party going composed of the extremists who he thinks he dominates. In reality, they dominate him. His ten years' reign revealed other baser aspects of his character. He was a womaniser. This in a Muslim ruler is, of course, in itself nothing unusual or shameful, but there were a furtive underhand quality in his womanising. He was widely and once publicly accused of seducing the wives of his ministers and officials, and on his European jaunts he had disported himself with mistresses using the title of Prince Usama. He also showed greed for money and possessions. His attempts to acquire land for himself, for he had no private fortune, remarks a writer in the Survey of International Affairs for 1934, laid him open to criticism. What the writer meant may be illustrated from a case which the United States Minister in Baghdad reported in the Dispatch of July 1932. The case which, according to this dispatch, was widely known and talked about, concerned an extensive tract of land on the outskirts of Baghdad, which an Armenian landlord had transformed into an orchard with 40,000 trees. The king coveted the land and the government started expropriation proceedings, having so changed the law that the compensation to which the proprietor was entitled became derisory. In the years following Faisal's accession, it became the official British refrain that Faisal was the free choice of Mesopotamia. We have been accused frequently and vigorously, stated B.H. Bordelon, a high official at the British residency in Baghdad, of foisting an alien king upon a people unwilling to receive him. That he asserted is sheer nonsense. The evidence, of course, absolutely contradicts this assertion. Some of it has been examined in another work. It will suffice here to refer to one incident characteristic of the times. When Faisal came to Iraq, the sous-prefet of Tariq in the Kirkuk area one day received an order to organise a petition in favour of Faisal's candidature. But towards the evening, he heard a rumour that the British had changed their minds. Having no means of discovering how things really stood, he decided to prepare two petitions, signatures and all, one in favour of and one against the candidature, and in due course presented both to his British superior. The words of the American consul, in fact, sum up the situation. Exactly. The Emir Faisal, he wrote in the dispatch of the 7th of July, 1921, comes as the candidate for the throne of Mesopotamia. His candidacy is very unpopular, but he has the support of the government and will probably win. No one will dare put forward another candidate or make open propaganda against him. However, it is still announced that the people will be left free to choose whomever they desire. Faisal then was brought to govern a country riven by obscure and malevolent factions, unsettled by the war and its aftermath, and confused by the sudden disappearance of a rule some four centuries old. He had now to establish his authority and impose his will on men in whom the collapse of the old order had awakened vast cupidities and revived venomous hatreds. At the best of times, Mesopotamia, as its history shows, requires strong men to rule it, and Faisal, as all who have reason to know him agreed, was a weak man. In order, therefore, to govern his new state, he had to recourse to the shifts and contrivances which weak men placed in positions of power have to use, 
deceit, double dealing, complicated intrigues, ambiguous advances and still more ambiguous retreats. Faisal owed his throne to the British, as Miss Bell put it in a private letter. We have carried him on our shoulders, and the British did continue faithfully to carry him on their shoulders. The High Commissioner, the British advisers and inspectors, the Colonial Office in London, and the British representatives in Geneva used the power and resources of the Empire to protect, uphold, shield and magnify their clients. They could do so. As well else, for a Faisal in Iraq was their creature, they by the same token were committed, were bound to him, for what became impossible, unthinkable, in spite of any doubts or misgivings, to ban the policy of which ministers and officials had publicly staked their reputations. But this British protection and support made it all the more necessary for Faisal to cultivate anti-British sentiment. He had to govern a country among whose tribes anti-British sentiments had been found to such an extent that civil war resulted, and he had to govern with the help of ex-Ottoman officials who had no reason to feel grateful to Britain. There was as yet little patriotic feeling in the country, and a great deal of pro-Ottomanism, wrote Miss Bell in September 1921. As a very large part of the population, wrote the American consul in the following November, who would welcome with open arms the return of the Turks, and again in January 1922, fires would never have been popular, was forced upon the country and almost all the Arabs are said to harbour a resentment and some 18 months later the verdict is the same. There appears to be absolutely no enthusiasm for Faisal in any part of the country and the opposition is quite open and often very bitter. Here then was Faisal's dilemma. He could not dispense with British military support since he was a foreigner who had neither position nor following in the country and to create this position and this following he had to oppose his benefactors the British and give countenance to his, their enemies. The methods he adopted to resolve this dilemma will illustrate his character. He appointed as Chamberlain of his court Fami al Mudaris, an ex Ottoman official and descendant of a well known Baghdad family of divines, a man who had all reason to deplore and abominate the situation of his country and the humiliation which British arms had inflicted on Islam. He was not a friend of Faisal's patrons. On the 23rd of August 1922, the first anniversary of Faisal's accession to the throne, the British High Commissioner Sir Percy Cox, coming to offer his congratulations, found himself received by a crowd outside the Royal Palace who were shouting hostile slogans. Evidently, says the High Commissioner in account of the incident, by design on the part of the King's Chamberlains, the leaders of the two extreme nationalist parties had been given appointments just before myself and after offering their congratulations to the King, had prolonged their visit to the Royal Apartments so as to ensure that they should be present when I arrived, and on his arrival they were stationed on the balcony of the Royal Palace, making anti-British speeches to the crowd below. One of these leaders was Mahdi al-Basir, a Shiite, one of that group of Baghdad Shiites who, organised in the Harass Party, had done so much to encourage the uprising of the Euphrates tribes against the British rule in the summer of 1920. On this occasion it was by direction or permission of Mudaris, as the British letter of protest to Faisal put it, that he was making the inflammatory speech abusive of the British in Iraq. The High Commissioner demanded that the King should punish those responsible, but providently for him, Faisal at that very moment became incapacitated by illness, and it was the High Commissioner himself who had to carry out and incur unpopularity for the measures he had demanded. Previous to this incident, the King had been intriguing against his own cabinet, presided over by Abdul Rahman al Nakib, an upright and honourable old man, and against pro British elements in the provinces. He attempted to draw to his side the Shiite divines who had led the anti British rebellion two years before. It was then rumoured in Baghdad, writes a biographer of Mohammed al Sadr, one of these divines, that His Majesty King Faisal expressed his feelings towards the Nakib's cabinet and asked that something be done to destroy it. His Grace al Sadr therefore assembled at his house in Kazamain the ulamas and some tribal heads, and deliberations ended with a petition to be presented to his majesty, containing national, i.e. extreme demands, which the Nakib's cabinet would not be able to bear. An Iraqi minister who was then an administrative official tells us in his memoirs that Faisal, in order to bring about the downfall of his cabinet, incited Ali Jordat, one of those Iraqi officers who had been with him in Syria, who was then Mutasarif of Hila, to go to Najaf, a main Shiite centre, and rouse the Shiite tribe so lately pacified by his British patrons. Ali Jordat seems also to have concerted a secret plan with the tribal leader Abd al Wahid al Hajj Sikha, set up in each tribe on the mid Euphrates a sheikh who would be the rival of the existing British appointed sheikh and who would refuse to obey the incumbent sheikh's orders. A similar tactic was followed in the Muntafiq, another Shiite area, but Mutasar Farif. Yassin al Hashimi, who had also been a member of Faisal's regime in Syria. But pro British tribes were here so numerous that they attacked him and Yassin had to flee the Liwa he was supposed to administer.
The king, in fact, intrigued to such a good purpose that the provinces were again in turmoil and public order in the Muntafik, this is the British official report, hung in a trembling balance when the cabinet indicated its disquiet at these proceedings and demanded that the king should now unequivocally that it could rely on his support and assistance, he characteristically replied with an ambiguity, saying that he saw no reason to change his policy. We hear the echo of these affairs in Miss Bell's letters to her parents. Miss Bell was distressed by Faisal's mischievous activities, and she went to remonstrate him and tell him how unhappy he was making her. I began by asking him whether he believed in my personal sincerity and devotion to him, He said he could not doubt it because he knew what I had done for him last year. I said in that case I could speak with perfect freedom and that I was extremely unhappy. I had formed a beautiful and gracious snow image to which I had given allegiance and I saw it melting before my eyes. For every noble outline had been obliterated, I preferred to go in spite of my love for the Arab nation and my sense of responsibility for its future. I did not think I could bear to see the evaporation of the dream which had guided me day by day. She approached him for staring up the Muntafik against the British advisor, Major Yetz, who, in the days when I had upheld the Arab cause against A.T. Wilson, had stood by her and her cause. The interview was emotional. He kissed her hand at intervals on leaving. It was she who attempted to kiss his hand, and he warmly embraced me. I am still, she confessed, sous le coup of this interview. These intense sentimental encounters could not, of course, make Faisal more upright or more dependable. The bouleversement in which they plunged the Oriental Secretary of the British Residency, indicate only how sodden with emotion was her approach to Oriental politics. But it may be objected that while such behaviour merely continued the tactics which Faisal had followed in Damascus, yet as the years went by and his rule became firmer, the king changed his character and shared his weaknesses. That his experience deepened and his authority increased, but such it was not the case. It is of course true that his situation in Baghdad was vastly different from that in Damascus, the cause, however, lay not in him but in the circumstances he confronted. In Mesopotamia, he did not have to contend with France bent on asserting its authority. He was, on the contrary, surrounded by the solicitude and the devotion of foreign protectors, by British officials labouring throughout the length and breadth of the land to establish his authority and increase his influence, and by the Royal Air Force ever ready to punish tribal rebels and strike terror in the heart of his enemies. Furthermore, the British government, which was doing so much for Faisal, seemed anxious to give in to his demands one after the other. He seemed anxious, finally, to get rid of the responsibility and to bestow the plenitude of the power on its client. This is why Faisal's policy, which he himself succinctly and exactly defined as one of taking and demanding, a policy which failed miserably with the French in Damascus, succeeded so brilliantly with the indulgent British in Baghdad. Faisal's testing time would have come the end of the mandate and the withdrawal of the British power, which time and again so providently solved his dilemmas for him. Fortunately, perhaps for him, he died soon after Iraq became fully independent, and he did not have to negotiate unaided the murderous currents of Iraqi politics. A decade of rule did not seem to increase his popularity. In a dispatch of February 1932, the American Charged Affairs declared that when Faisal appeared on the streets, no one took much notice of him. He himself has often seen the king pass along the main street. But the only people who seemed to take any notice were the foreigners, who paused and lifted their hats. But Faisal himself seems to become cocky and overconfident. In a speech which he gave towards the end of 1931, he recalled his brief inglorious rule in Damascus and told the Syrians that if they had listened to his advice, they would be enjoying independence like the Iraqis. He brought back from his European trips admiration for Mussolini. He wanted to emulate the Italian dictator, trying to concentrate policy in his own hands in the belief that he could govern the country with the help of a small body of advisers. A newspaper article, no doubt, inspired by him, advocated a one-party system and ruled by an enlightened despot, the despot in question clearly being Faisal himself. A few months before he died, he was in the judgment of a high British official in a fair way to becoming a dictator but it is extremely doubtful whether he would have been able to sustain such a role in a crisis or against determined opposition. One episode, which took place shortly before his death, gives a clue to what might have happened had he lived on. The Assyrians, Christian Hill people, who originally lived in southeastern Turkey, were seduced by Russian promises during the First World War from their allegiance to the Ottoman state. They rose in rebellion and finally had to flee from Ottoman territory. The end of the war found them a miserable remnant of refugees in the care of the British government, to whom they furnished contingents of efficient and brave levies, who fought to settle them in Mosul, which the League of Nations had awarded to Iraq, one of the reasons of the award being that the Assyrians should not once again come under Turkish rule.
When Iraq became independent, relations between the Iraqi government and the Assyrians went from bad to worse. The trouble came to a head in the summer of 1933. The king was abroad and Rashid Ali al Ghaliani was prime minister in Baghdad. The Shiites in the south were almost in open rebellion against the government. To create a diversion and unite all Muslims against non-Muslims, Ghaliani and his colleagues determined to hit the Assyrians hard. The government detained their patriarch in Baghdad and dispatched a force to Mosul under Bakir Sidki, which clashed with a body of armed Assyrians and then carried out an indiscriminate massacre in the Assyrian village of Simel. When the king heard of the patriarch's detention and the dispatch of the army, he repeatedly sent emphatic telegrams to his prime minister, asking him to follow a policy of moderation, not to push the Assyrians to desperate acts, and particularly not to insist on forcibly disarming them alone. When all the tribes of Iraq, including the Assyrians, Kurdish neighbours, disposed of weapons which the government was not proposed to taking away, the government's measures, the king thought, were bound to leave a deplorable impression abroad. Rashid Ali was not to be deflected from his grim purpose by the king's objections. The honour of the government, he kept on saying, must be upheld. We must teach the Assyrians that they cannot rebel with impunity. Firm measures must be taken. We are sorry to have displeased your majesty, his last telegram blandly said, but we apprehended no external danger which could threaten the country as a result of the measures we took to uphold the law. The resolute Rashid Ali had his way. He brushed aside the king and his apprehensions and was proved right, for no danger except some League of Nations resolutions ever did threaten the newly won independence. This incident, like the palace incident of 1922, shows that the king's character and position were still the same as in Damascus. That, as in Damascus, a crisis or an emergency would find him the plaything and the prisoner of his strong-willed and violent followers. The massacre having taken place, the king decided to return to Baghdad, where his last public act was to stand at a balcony of his palace and acknowledge the acclaim of the delirious crowd celebrating Bakir Sidki's victory. Had he publicly indicated his disapproval of the massacre, the crowd, incited by the government, would probably have turned on him and deposed him. There had been indeed rumours that he would abdicate in favour of his son, and strong indications, as the American minister put it, that nationalists were threatening to force his abdication, and the crowd acclaiming the Assyrians' massacre shouted not only long live the king, but also long live the Emir Ghazi, and long live King Ghazi. When Faisal died soon afterwards, a Baghdad newspaper went so far as to allege that he had actually committed suicide. He was succeeded by his son Ghazi, who reigned until 1939, when he was killed in the car accident. The son was even less suited than the father to monarchical office. He was, as the British ambassador described him, a weak and unstable as water, of intemperate habits, choosing as his boon companions, palace servants and wild young army officers. The father at least had dignity and prudence and was so charming in his manner that he seemed to have captivated and attached himself to those numerous British officials who did so much. To further his ambitions, he also had the good sense to trust himself to their devotion and to allow them valiantly to fight his battles for him. Lord Keynes recounts a story which, whether true or not, is as symbolic of Faisal's pathetic incompetence as of the methods and the legends which accompanied his rise to power. It was about this time, writes Keynes, describing the atmosphere of Paris during the peace negotiations of 1919, that the Emir Faisal, so it was alleged, resided in M. Pichon's cabinet, unabashed by the naked charms of Rubens Mary de Medici's A Chapter of the Quran, whilst Colonel Lawrence, in his capacity of the Emir's interpreter, propounded an ingenious politic for the creation of an Arab hegemony from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf over Damascus and Mosul and Baghdad. Of Ghazi, such a story could not have been told. This royal youth, whose father worried about his backwardness, was given to as violent courses as the wildest of his companions. One of his pranks, which Dugori reports, was to have a servant's face painted with luminous paint. This waster was, however, by no means uninterested in politics, whether internal or external. It is highly likely that he was privy to Bakir Sidki's coup in 1936 against Yasin al-Hashimi's ministry. If he did not actually inspire it, Yasin, it would seem, had wished to marry his own daughter to the young monarch, and this inspired in Ghazi mistrust in his chief minister and fear of his designs. Yasin's brother Taha, who was dismissed as chief of staff as a result of Bakir's coup, recorded in his diaries his conviction that the king was pleased by the coup d'etat because Yasin's government had sought to preserve his honour by preventing this youth who inclined to be dissolute and lewd from mixing with those who had no morals. When the coup took place, Yasin, it would seem, asked Ghazi to sign a proclamation denouncing it, but the king was unwilling, and this led Yasin to offer his resignation without putting up any resistance. Ghazi's ex-tutor later informed Taha that the king was boasting that it was he who had organised the coup. Suspicion of Ghazi was strong among Yasin's colleagues, 
who had been unseated by the coup, so strong indeed that Nouri al Said went so far as to propose his services to Ibn Saud in securing the Iraqi throne for one of his sons. Shortly before his death in 1939, Ghazi, it would seem, was involved in another coup d'etat, an abortive one, against Nouri al Said, who was then Prime Minister. In foreign politics, Ghazi seems to have had the same irredentist ambitions which are characteristic of his house. Propaganda on his behalf was rife in Syria and Palestine, and his public pronouncements reinforced this propaganda. At a military review, for instance, he held on the occasion of his birthday in March 1939, his speech referred to our Arab brothers in whose future and welfare we are interested. Several people reported, the American minister stated in a dispatch, that the king had actually referred by name to Syria, Palestine and Kuwait, though the address as published did not contain these references. A Syrian who was then working in Baghdad tells us that he wrote an incendiary article on Syria, which was broadcast on the king's radio station and followed by Ghazi's voice exclaiming, I run to thine aid, I run to thine aid, O Syria. Labaiki, labaiki, ya Syria. A year or so before his death, he installed a private transmitter in his palace, said to be a gift from the Nazis, and broadcast incitement and sedition to the population of the Principality of Kuwait, where as a result, an abortive revolt broke out. One evening, shortly before his death, when the Prime Minister was abroad, Ghazi summoned the Chief of the General Staff and ordered him to arrange for the army, immediately to occupy Kuwait. The order threw his entourage into a panic, and they summoned the acting Prime Minister, who persuaded the King to abandon his scheme. Ghazi was succeeded by his infant son Faisal, who was brought up by his mother, who died when he was still an adolescent, and by her devoted sisters. A pleasant and harmless young man, he ascended the throne in 1953 and was mowed down by his army five years later. During his brief reign, he lived in the shadow of his uncle Abd al ilah the regent and the crown prince, and of Nuri al Said, who, in the last years of his life, ruled preeminent over all the politicians of Iraq. With the murder of Faisal II and the brief Sharifian period of Iraq, began with intrigue and civil war, ended in horror and bloodshed. Though Lloyd George agreed with Berthelot's estimate of Faisal's character, he yet pleaded that the sheikhs of Mesopotamia wanted him to be king. How far was this the case? It is, of course, true that when he was negotiating with the French, a civil war was raging in Iraq. The Shiite tribes of the Euphrates inspired their religious leaders in Najaf, Kabbalah, and Katimemain, and by the incitement and help of the Sharifian agents from Syria, were in a state of dissidence, attacking British troops, cutting communications and besieging towns and administrative centres. But the Shiite divines who inspired their revolts were not exerting themselves in order that Faisal and his Sunni ex-Ottoman officers should be installed to rule over them from Baghdad. These divines, encouraged by the departure of the Ottomans, saw in the unsettlement of Mesopotamia after 1918, an opportunity to obtain power and the preponderance after so many centuries of sunny domination. When the British government, having put down the Euphrates revolt, proceeded to install Faisal and his followers in Baghdad, their dismay was great. So strongly did they manifest their discontent at this turn in events that Faisal's government, under British inspiration, alleged as a convenient pretext modern notions of nationality, then quite unknown to the country, had then deported from Mesopotamia on the score that they were Persian subjects. The British official reports concerned to justify these actions itself gives an indication of the true state of affairs and of the motives of the leaders of the revolt in 1920. The political ambitions of the Shia religious headquarters, we read in the report of 1922-3, have always lain in the direction of theocratic domination. They had been sedulously checked by the Turks, but it might reasonably be hoped that the Arab government in its initial stages would not offer so resolute an opposition, provided that it could be deprived of British support. The Mujtahids, who are almost without exception Persian subjects, have to no motive for their refraining from sacrificing the interests of Iraq to those which they conceive to be their own, nor does their attitude of obscurantist detachments on the world, and from any science save that which is based on the Muslim scripture, place them in a position to gauge the needs of a state which is striving in the path of progress and enlightened self-government. The Shiites remained unconvinced of these benefits and persuaded that the Baghdad government was a creature of the British and an instrument of Sunni persecution, different from its Ottoman predecessor only in that it was without benefit of long legitimate possession and that in its rule did not derive from conquest but was bestowed upon it by the British.
A Baghdad journalist recounts how he took a trip to the Euphrates in 1927 in the company of Glub and of a Shiite tribal leader who had taken part in a revolt in 1920. They were looking at one of the battlefields of the revolts and Glub, it seems, observed that the objects of the uprising had been attained. You now have, the journalist reports him as saying, a government, a constitution, a parliament, ministers and officials, what more can you want? Whereupon the tribal leader interrupted him, saying bitterly, yes, but they speak with a foreign accent. Another Shiite who took some part in the uprising in 1920 in his memoirs bitterly comments on the contrast between the British treatment of those who took part in the Sharif's revolt and those who collaborated in the Iraqi revolt. In the in Iraq, he says, the former were overwhelmed with wealth, spoils and position, so that having been poor, they are now men of large means and having been famished are now satiated. Shiite grievances remained alive and led again and again to revolts and agitations in the Euphrates. Engineers and exploited by the politicians of Baghdad in their unbridled quest for power. Even before the end of the mandates, the Baghdad politicians were preparing to exploit these grievances and the Shiite leaders, tribal and religious, were getting ready to extract what advantages they could from the play of political rivalries in the capital. At the beginning of 1931, Yasin al-Hashimi, Rashid Ali al-Ghalani and Jafar Abu Timan, then associated in opposition to Nuri al-Sayed's administration, visited Kabala to organise Shiite support some six months later when strikes against Nuri were being organised in Baghdad. The Shiite tribes were reported to have offered their assistance to Yasin, who informed them that the time was not yet ripe since the British were still in control and that they should prepare for action as soon as Iraq became independent of member of the League. When this event took place, we find the Shiites informing Yassin that he would not receive their support unless he was ready to offer them the majority of the cabinet posts. The Baghdad politicians, Sunni ex-Ottoman officers and civil servants, who were claiming to deliver Arabism from Ottoman oppression, and exploiting and exacerbating the Shiite grievances, were benefiting from the traditional anti-Shiite policy of the Ottomans. This anti-Shiite policy had its roots in the traditional enmity and mistrust obtaining between the Persians and the Ottomans since the 16th century. And fomenting an anti-British rising in 1920, the Shiite divines no doubt hoped to gain an established ascendancy for their community in a country where the Shiites were a majority, albeit hitherto a powerless one. It is difficult to say whether the failure of the uprising or the importation of Faisal and his men which followed it was to them more galling. A Sharifian regime in Baghdad, at all events, spelt renewed Sunni dominance. Bazir Gan, who was in Faisal's entourage when he arrived in Mesopotamia, reports as a kind of premonitory symptom the fact that Faisal's followers were already asking how many Shiites had been in government employment in Ottoman times. Sunni Shiite antagonism was a constant of Iraqi politics under the mandate. The government, the Shiites complained, was the privilege of Sunnis, against whose fanaticism nobody would now protect them. These Shiite grievances we find expressed in the document which appeared early in 1932, when the mandate was nearing its end. Issued by the Executive Committee of the Shias in Iraq, the document is no doubt in some respects a partisan exaggeration, but it is on the whole valuable, not only because many of its complaints were well-founded, but because it gives us some idea of Shiite disaffection towards the political institutions of Faisal's kingdom. Since the House of Parliament has been formed, we have never heard of one Shia Muslim having been elected from the northern, i.e. Sunni district, whereas from our districts only one or two Shiites are elected and the rest are from the other faction. No Shiite had been given the Ministry of the Interior or any other important post. The government's land policies created all kinds of enmities and feuds between the Shaikhs of our tribes. Government teachers imbue the students with all kinds of religious beliefs. Shiite officials were few in number and inferior in position, and the document ended by calling on Great Britain to take effective measures and release us from the disgraceful rule of this faction and the religious fanaticism it exerts to satisfy its personal ambitions. The end of the mandate provided no abatement of Sunni Shiite friction. On the contrary, as Yassin al Hashimi predicted in 1931, the total disappearance of British control enabled the Baghdad politicians to exploit intensively Shiite grievances, and mid-1930 saw the outbreak of one revolt after another, encouraged and embedded by one faction or another in Baghdad, and feeding upon Shiite grievances. One such revolt was prefaced in March 1935 by a Shiite manifesto, the first article of which stated, Since independence until today, the Iraqi government has followed a foolish policy inconsistent with the interests of the people. It has adopted the policy of sectarian discrimination as a basis for rule, usually having only one or two acquiescent ministers in the cabinet to represent the Shiite majority. It has followed the same policy in the appointment of officials and its partiality in the selection of civil servants and the members of parliament has become obvious.
In order to infuse once more confidence and a sense of security in the people and to do away with discrimination, all must participate in the cabinet, in parliament and in all public employments as they share in the payment of taxes and military service. Faisal himself towards the end of his reign showed that he was quite aware of the Shiites' attitude to the regime. In a memorandum which he wrote and circulated among his intimates in 1932, he said that the Shiites believed that death and taxes were their lot, while official positions went to the Sunnis and that even the holy days of the Shiites were not respected by the government. Nor were the Shiites mistaken in their grievances. In the Parliament of 1933, for instance, and in this it was typical of other parliaments that preceded over or succeeded it, a country predominantly composed of Kurds and Shiites returned a chamber of deputies in which there were 28 Shiites, 16 Kurds and 36 members drawn from the small Arab minority which the British government had installed in power in 1921. The Shiites had other grievances, one which they shared with the Kurds, the Yazidis and other minorities, was that the government which had entertained grandiose pan-Arab ambitions was intent on making Iraq into a great Middle Eastern military power, but this universal military conscription was necessary. So long as the mandate lasted, in alliance with the Kurds, they had successfully opposed its introduction, since the British government was also unwilling to agree to it. With the disappearance of British control, the government was able to push through its parliament the necessary legislation, but the attempt to apply the law caused resistance not only among the Yazidis, but among the tribes of the south, who revolted in September 1935 and in February and April 1936. As they said in a letter written before the April 1936 revolt, they found it incredible that the government should impose such a burden on them. Government, they wrote, had a right to pay their taxes and their obedience and had never demanded more. The pan-Arabism of the regime sometimes also took a form offensive to the Shiite religious beliefs. The pan-Arabs wished to revive the glories of Arab empire, and the more fervent among them, this meant exalting the purely Arab Umayyads, depreciating the Persianized Abbasids, and denouncing Shiism as a foreign subversive heresy. In 1927, a Syrian Muslim teaching in a government college published a book in which the Umayyads, who had persecuted the Caliph Ali and his house, were glorified. The Shiites took great offence at this insult to their religion and organised demonstrations in Baghdad to which the Sunnis replied. The demonstrations turned into riots in which many students and policemen were killed. The Shiites were again insulted in 1933 by a Sunni polemist who denounced them as anti-Arab in belief and tendency. The scandal caused by this pamphlet led to those disturbances to alleviate which perhaps the repression of the Assyrians was decided upon. If, despite Lloyd George, the sheikhs neither wanted nor were ever reconciled to Faisal's regime, who then was in its favour? In a Muslim country, the cities are traditionally preeminent in politics. What did the cities think of Faisal when the news of his impending arrival in Mesopotamia reached Balsara? 4,500 notables, as the British official report indicates, signed a petition which an influential deputation presented to the High Commissioner, requesting that they should not come under Faisal's control. Suleimaniya was a purely Kurdish town and the Kurds, as will be seen, would have no part or lot with an Arab government. Kirkuk, as the League of Nations Commission on Mosul reported in 1925, was Turkish. Arbil, the commission also wrote, was divided into seven boroughs. We interviewed the Mukhtars of these boroughs. When asked what was their nationality, five replied that they were Turks, one that he was as much a Turk as a Kurd, and the seventh stated that he was a Jew. Of these towns and cities, only Mosul a Sunni Arab city on the fringe of the Kurdish and Turkish area could perhaps be said to favour an Arab Sunni government or Mesopotamia. Even so, it proved by no means easy to elicit unequivocal support for the kingdom. The residency had to exert its influence, such as Abdullah al Kasab, who was then Iraqi Mutasarif of Mosul, tells us in his memoirs it proves necessary for him to take in hand the witnesses appearing before the commission, and since the notables were either reluctant to declare for Iraq and Arabism, he also found it necessary to organise and encourage popular and student demonstrations. Though he is rather discreet on the subject, we may suspect that he also winked at even more forcible methods by which Turkish sympathisers, who seem to have been numerous, were persuaded of the error of their ways. Baghdad itself, the capital and most important city of Mesopotamia, could hardly be considered an Arab Sunni centre. It was the administrative and commercial centre of the area. A city with an illustrious Muslim past and with a population mixed in the extreme, in it lived Shiites, Kurds, Persians and the official and religious classes who supplied the personnel of the local Ottoman administration. In it, the Jews were actually the largest single group in the population. The Jews declared that they did not want Faisal and the Shiites, as has been seen, were playing a torturous game which they lost when Faisal was imposed on them. As the official classes, 
they have remained loyal until the end of the Ottoman state and were now smarting under the humiliation of the defeat at the hands of a Christian power, a defeat to which they might yet learn to be resigned, but which in 1920 were still too near not to arouse bitterness and hatred. They were certainly anti-British, but thus did not mean that they were ready to welcome or even to acknowledge the leadership of Faisal and his followers, who had deserted the Ottoman state in its hour of its needs and collaborated with the enemy. The older and wiser among them, such as the principal Sunni notable in Baghdad, Sayyid Abdul Rahman al-Nakib, who accepted defeat and cooperated loyally and honourably with the British, indicated in no uncertain terms the distaste for and poor opinion of Faisal. For these official classes had never taken seriously the plots and agitations of the nationalist officers who went over to the British after 1914, and had never shown the slightest inclination to secede from the Ottoman Empire. The chroniclers, it is true, record the brief appearance before 1914 of so-called nationalist secret societies in Basra, Baghdad and Mosul, but these, it would seem, were inspired by the Basra magnate Said Talib, the better to prosecute a private quarrel with Constantinople, and were no more heard of when the Said and the state were reconciled. Indeed, when war broke out, the British government made overtures to Said Talib, which he refused. He was caught by the British on a mission to incite Ibn Saud to join the Ottomans. He was deported to India, where he remained until 1917. This episode, it may be said in passing, can perhaps throw light on the period in the life of Nuri al Said, which he always kept obscure. Before joining the Sharif's rebellion in 1916, Nuri was confined in a prisoner of war camp in India. He had not been taken prisoner in battle as an officer in the Ottoman army, for he had deserted from the uh, army a few months before the outbreak of the war and had taken refuge in Basra with Sayyid Talib. It was there that the British found him when they occupied Basra and supported him to India. Why, it may be asked, was a man with such a record, a deserter from an enemy army, treated in such a way? Can the explanation be that he fell under suspicion because he was a retainer of Sayyid Talib's and thus he was anxious to disown the connection when the Sayyid became later Faisal's rival? Suleiman Faidi, Sayyid Talib's principal, political lieutenant at that period, whose memoirs shed so much light on these obscure events. He, he has recorded that when T.E. Lawrence, who visited Basra in 1915, tried to persuade him to undertake an anti-Turkish movement in Mesopotamia. He refused and informed Lawrence that if the Turks were the enemies of the British, it did not follow that they were also the enemies of the Arabs. Neither the towns then, nor the Shiite tribes, could be said to have wanted Faisal. Some, as has been seen, were actively opposed to him and his party. Exactly the same is true of the Kurdish tribes of the north. They vehemently declared that they had no desire to be ruled from Baghdad. Immediately after the war, the British authorities had officially informed the Kurdish tribal chiefs that there was no intention of imposing upon them an administration foreign to their habits and desires. When Faisal was imported into Iraq, the North as a whole had first to be coerced by the Royal Air Force and then gradually coaxed by British officials, using their influence and good repute, into casting their lot with the Baghdad regime. As Bourdillon publicly admitted as late as 1924, it was absurd to say that the Kurds wanted to merge with the Arabs. It is clear that when the League Commission investigated the Mosul Territory in 1925, the Kurds, as well as other sections of the population, would have emphatically desired to join Turkey had they not been given the impression that British officials would remain for a long time to guide and control the actions and policies of the Faisal regime. And the Commission itself recommended that the territory be attached to Baghdad, only on condition that the British mandate would last for at least 25 years. But we may doubt whether the mandatory ever intended the mandate to last anything like a quarter of a century. In 1922, the text of the Anglo-Iraqi Treaty had originally set the mandate a term of 20 years. Owing to agitation in Parliament and the press about the cost of holding Mesopotamia, the Conservative government, which succeeded Lloyd George's administration, reduced this term to four years. The amended treaty was ratified in 1924 after strong British pressure, and the Mosul issue figured a great deal in the debates preceding ratification. To overcome the powerful resistance to the treaty, which was organised in the Constituent Assembly and on the Baghdad streets, the British authorities carried on a press campaign in the Baghdad Times. Their official mouthpiece, which threatened that unless the treaty was ratified, Mosul would be lost to the Turks. On the 2nd of June 1924, the newspaper wrote that the deputies ought to also to know that if they do not ratify the treaty, they will probably lose Mosul. If the treaty is ratified, Britain intends to do all that lies in her power to keep the old Mosul vilayet as part of Iraq. Again, on the 6th of June, rather than have Percy Cox and the full might of Britain to defend Mosul, the Assembly prefers to trust Sheikh Ahmed al Sheikh Daoud, a prominent opponent of ratification, to defend Mosul against the Turks. Two days later, an editorial proclaimed with liberal use of the italics, 
Britain, the country with the noblest record in Europe, has offered to help Iraq to become free and independent in four years at most, perhaps in less. Finally, on the 10th of June, the climax of the campaign, again making heavy use of italics, the leader suggested, We think the government would do well to ask each member of today's session publicly to state whether he wishes to restore Mosul to the Turks or to keep it for Iraq. When that day, in the late hours, enough deputies were finally got together to provide a majority for ratification, the motion ratifying the treaty which they approved stipulated that this instrument would have no force if the British government did not safeguard the rights of Iraq in the whole of Mosul Vilayet. And, and as is well known, the British did their best to secure this province for their clients. But when the Mosul Commission recommended that Iraq could have the Vilayet only on condition that Britain continue to be mandatory for 25 years, a situation arose which neither the Anglo-Iraqi Treaty nor the debates which preceded it had com- contemplated. It is instructive to note Miss Bell's reaction to the recommendation of the Mosul Commission. As early as March 1925, when the Commission was still in the country, she gathered unofficially from the Italian Secretary to the Commission, who was then her informant, that such a recommendation was likely. Writing to her stepmother, she remarked how silly such a stipulation was since in her, the last report. The League of Nations was quite powerless to enforce it, and she added, I don't think if it will matter. She was, of course, right. When the report was laid before the League, the British government abounded in promises and assurances, and most were passed to Iraq. Barely a year later, we find the ending of the Iraq mandate being already actively discussed. I do not think, remarked Amory to Austin Chamberlain in a letter of the 4th of April 1927, that anyone at Geneva 15 months ago dreamt what we should propose Iraq for membership of the League in 1928, and at first sight I am inclined to think that we might have travelled from Turkey, as well as from the League, on the ground that we had secured the Mosul frontier by a trick. In the event, the mandate lasted barely six more years, which saw the British government rapidly abandon one after another of the responsibilities it had solemnly accepted. The Kurds and the Turks, whom with misplaced ethnological zeal the British officials and the Iraqis after them had in- insisted on calling Turkomans, or Kirkuk, Suleimanie, Arbil and Mosul together with their rich oil fields, were given over to an Arab regime which came to dispose of the vast oil revenues how and where it liked. The Kurds in particular could with justice complain that left to its own devices, the Iraqi government would have never been able to bring them into subjection. That pressure exerted by British officials and bombing carried out by the Royal Air Force until the very eve of independence alone subdued them, delivering them to the alien, heavy-handed, but precarious rule of Baghdad. It is, of course, not unusual in the Middle East for government to be exercised by one group over other alien groups. Such exactly was the situation of the Ottomans before the destruction of their empire. But the Ottomans had exercised rule not by false pretenses, but on the strength of their military and administrative ability. Again, the Ottoman government was not given to doctrinaire adventures, while the Baghdad government was a government of pan-Arabs, perpetually looking beyond the frontiers of Iraq to other Arab territories, and dreaming to be the Prussia or the Piedmont of a new Arab empire. The Kurds had no use for such dreams. They might say, and they did, that the state of which they formed part was Iraqi, not Arab. These things it was possible to say before the British finally relinquished their mandate, After 1932, with the Baghdad government enjoying the utmost plenitude of power, talk of this kind became disloyalty and treason. British action then, from 1920 until the end of the mandate in 1932, worked powerfully to create a Baghdad, a centralised government ruling over a population disparate and heterogeneous in the extreme, whom no ties of affection, loyalty or custom bound to its rulers. To establish the authority of these rulers, therefore, the British, following the logic of their choice, had to exert their power and their influence and eliminate all potential and actual resistance to them, and the fortunate Baghdad government found at its disposal the Royal Air Force to coerce and to inhibit all opposition, and devoted British officials to use their prestige, ability and good name in its favour. Some did the government of Mesopotamia have in the past the benefit of such assets. The British tamed the Shiites and the Kurds and made it clear to the Jews, the Assyrians and other groups that they had to look to Faisal and his men for their protection and welfare. Under their auspices, a constitution was promulgated which concentrated all authority in a cabinet responsible to a legislature. This constitution, moreover, deliberately denied in all its provisions any safeguards to the various large and important communities who found themselves willy-nilly subjects of the Baghdad government. Many attempts were made to secure and entrench some safeguards for them, but they came to nothing. The Baghdad politicians with the centralising instincts of ex-Ottoman officials set their faces against it, and it does not seem that the British officials who then guided them and supervised them expressed any misgivings about the working of a constitution on the Westminster model in the peculiar conditions of Mesopotamia.
The arguments against separate representation as expressed in the Constituent Assembly is exemplified by the words Duwad al-Shalabi of Mosul in the debate of the 31st of July 1924. It has been said, he declared, that minorities should be given a fixed number of seats in the Assembly, regardless of their proportion among the inhabitants. What is the reason for this demand? When we were considering the matter in committee, we summoned the representatives of the minorities to inform ourselves of their allegations and we asked them, why do you want deputies out of your proportion to your numbers? Their answer was silent. If they believe in our brotherliness and rely on our patriotism, why do they demand more than their due? The population of Iraq is known, and for every 20,000 inhabitants there is a deputy. If we allot extra deputies to them, we will be doing an injustice to the majority, but justice should apply to all. Is it right to apply the rules of the constitution to one group and not to another? The speaker went on to say that the example of the Ottoman Empire had shown that minorities should not be given privileges, which in the end would harm both majority and minority. The sultans had ceded such privileges as an act of grace, but in the end they had come to be considered a standing right and had threatened the very existence of the state. If the conditions of Iraq then such a government was bound to be a centralised despotism, the constitution contained no such checks and balances of the kind most familiar by that of the United States. Nor did the country, after the levying action undertaken by the British government from 1921 to 1932, contain independent centres of power able to check shorter rebellion, the actions of the Baghdad government. The cabinet, it is true, was supposed to be responsible to the legislature, but even before the mandate ended, it had become clear, as the report of the administration of Iraq for 1928 admitted, that elections and representative government were in Iraq a mockery. The writer of the report consoled himself with the thought that if the Iraqi Chamber of Deputies was not what it normally meant by a representative assembly, yet elections produce a body of men capable of criticising the proposals of the executive and of effectively resisting unwise legislation which might otherwise be put through by a small executive not too closely in touch with rural feeling. It did not seem to occur to this writer that an assembly which consisted of creatures of the government, nominated by the Minister of the Interior and elected on the instructions of his officials in the provinces, was not best calculated to oppose the policy of resistance to the government. What was already apparent during the mandate became unmistakable during independence, namely that the legislature could not control the cabinet, but that, on the contrary, elections to the Chamber of Deputies and appointments to the Senate were an additional weapon in the hands of the government which therefore the better to control the country. A curious and revealing incident which took place in the last years of the monarchy shows that it had become to be universally accepted that election was exactly equivalent to appointment. In 1953, the People's Socialist Party, i.e. Sali Jabba's faction, decided to boycott the elections. One One of its members, a tribal leader from the Euphrates, sure of being returned, disagreed with this decision. He himself, he said, was not prepared to withdraw his candidature unless the party's members who were senators and membership of the Senate was by appointment also resigned, since, as he claimed, both deputies and senators were equally appointed and there was no difference between them. Iraq under the monarchy faced two bare alternatives. Either the country would be plunged into chaos or its population should become universally the clients and dependents of an omnipotent but capricious and unstable government. To these two alternatives, the overthrow of the monarchy had not added a third. The quality of government in Iraq and the outlook it has bred in subject and servant alike has been sensitively described by an officer of the Royal Air Force who spent some years in the Euphrates towards the end of the mandate. Here he wrote, The structure of government is shaky and impermanent. Moreover, such control as government exerts over one's affairs is a terribly personal one. Government is not, as with us, a machine which grinds out laws, takes money out of one's pocket or puts money into it forbids one to do this and permits one to do that with dispassionate implacability. It enters into the house here. It knows that you have four sons and that one of them is a post office official in Mosul. It knows that you have Turkish leanings and that, as a natural consequence of such, you are not to be trusted. It knows that you were friends with Hamid Kuluf before his exile, that you are therefore probably sending information to Persia, and that it must on that account consider it in a fresh light what to do with your claim for water rights against Mohammed Dervish. It makes a vital difference to the issue of this or that land case whether Abdul Qadir happens to be Musa Safarif at the time of its coming before the courts or whether he has been transferred to another district and someone else is sitting in his place. It is this grossly personal element in the all-pervading activities of government which evokes from the uneducated people that quality which we are all too apt to dismiss as insincerity but which is, in reality, nothing but the inevitable compromise of any simple man chased by the bogey of insecurity. For an Englishman with a clear conscience, there are few occasions when, in facing an acquaintance, he has attempted to express views at variance with his true ones, 
that the Iraqi foreign official, or even before another of his own kind, is in doubt. He must propitiate and speak their words. His position is unstable. There is no permanence. He knows that the fact as to whether the official has a good or bad opinion of him will affect his private life vitally. He has the ground shifting beneath his feet. It is the same with the official himself when he addresses his superior. He too feels the ground quaking beneath him. He feels his confidence welling out. He may be sacked because his enemies have spoken ill of him. There will be no redress for him, no rehabilitation unless he has influence in higher places. The attitude of the ruling classes to the population they ruled was one of disdain and distaste. There were townsmen ruling over a population of primitive countrymen. There were Sunnis ruling over Shiites, Jews, Christians and other outlandish sects. They were the government in its exalted majesty and boundless power. The others were the subjects who must be prostrate in obedience. The texts of proclamations to the tribes in revolt are characteristic and revealing. The government desires to spare you. Come therefore with all speeds to the offices of the government and offer your obedience. Otherwise the government will punish you and yours will be the responsibility. When we consider the long experience of Britain in the government of eastern countries and set beside it the miserable polity which she bestowed on the populations of Mesopotamia, we are seized with rueful wonder. It is as though India and Egypt had never existed, as though Lord Cornwallis, Munro and Metcalf, John and Henry Lawrence, Milner and Cromer had attempted in vain to bring order, justice and security to the East, as though Burke and Macaulay, Bentham and James Mill had never addressed their intelligence to the problems and prospects of Oriental government. We can never cease to marvel how, in the end, all this was discarded and Mesopotamia, conquered by British arms, was buffeted to and fro between the fluent salesmanship of Lloyd George, the intermittent, orotund and futile declamations of Lord Curzon, the hysterical mendacity of Colonel Lawrence, the brittle cleverness and sentimental enthusiasm of Miss Bell, and the resigned acquiescence of Sir Percy Cox. What are we to say when we find a state paper presented by a Secretary of State to Parliament in 1929? declaring without the suspicion of a doubt or the shadow of a qualification, that it seemed evident that Iraq, judged by the criteria of internal security, sound public finance and enlightened administration, would be in every way fit for admission to the League of Nations by 1932, and fit therefore to exercise the unfettered sovereignty which independent states possess. What save that style of state papers, like so much else, suffered during the First World War irremediable degradation? But were the wages of degradation, we may ask, at least substantial? Let us look briefly at the record. The British imposed Faisal on Mesopotamia, but Faisal had been earlier imposed by the British on Syria, and his followers had used it as a base from which to foment rebellion in Mesopotamia. Faisal's imposition on Mesopotamia, therefore, looked paradoxically like an act of weakness. Miss Bell, coming back from the Cairo conference where Faisal's appointment was decided, admitted as much in a letter to Engbert. The tribes of the Euphrates, she wrote, discouraged by the failure of the rising which they now regard as a relapse into madness, are also bewildered to find that the Sharif's house which last year, so they were told, was anxious to turn us out, is now regarded by us as a suitable source from which an emir might spring. Miss Bell went on to deny that Faisal had a hand in stirring up the country, but since this assertion is flatly contrary to the evidence, we may regard it as expressing not the historical truth, but her emotional commitment to Faisal, whom, in the same letter, she describes as a man of high principles and high ideals. But in any case, whether or not the Sharifians were responsible for sedition in Mesopotamia, this, as she wrote, was what the propagandist said, and she added it was believed. The subtleties of British policy after Faisal's establishment were not calculated to diminish bewilderment and perplexity in the country. Reviewing P.W. Ireland's Iraq in 1938, a British official who knew Mesopotamia under the mandate wrote, Sir Percy Cox, Sir Henry Dobbs, Sir Bernard Bourdillon, and above all Sir Canahan Cornwallis kept on insisting, let Musa Sarif's prefets make mistakes if they want to, don't hamper their initiative. The best way to learn and appreciate the task of administration is by being free to act on one's own responsibility. This confusion between the activity of governing and the activity of educating is in itself and at all times fatal. Its consequences for the people of Mesopotamia were always unpleasant and sometimes disastrous. As for the British, it eroded their prestige and gave them a bad name for unreliability and deviousness. For who in their senses could believe that British advisers in shielding and supporting native officials who were incompetent, tyrannous and corrupt were only applying the educational theories of Sir Percy Cox, Sir Henry Dobbs, Sir Bernard Bourdillon, and above all, Sir Kinahan Cornwallis. The wonder that, as a writer put it in the early days of Faisal's reign, the mass of the people neither understood nor knew how to deal with the Iraqi government. In Turkish days, he continued, they knew their position, and knew that they could usually get what they wanted for cash. But on the days of the British government, they knew equally well that bribery was useless, 
They now see the same officials of the old Turkish days back in office again, like the British advisors somewhere in the offing, and they are mystified. They know the official can be bribed. They have bribed him before, but neither the official nor the Arab knows quite how much the advisor sees or what will happen if he does see. It is this, the writer concluded, which makes many of them think that the days of the Turks were the best after all, and might be the best thing for the future. British advisers and inspectors in the decade between Faisal's secession and the end of the mandate found themselves, it is true, in an impossible position. The executive power lay in the hands of the Iraqi government and its agents, and they were merely supposed to advise and supervise. Such advice and supervision was, on the other hand, deeply and naturally resented and was, on the other, quite ineffective. This ineffectiveness had a simple origin. The British government, which alone could have made the advice of British advisers effective, was interested not so much in the good government of Mesopotamia, as in speedily shedding all responsibility for it. British advice and inspection became therefore a make-believe and a rigmarole, and it became profitless to cultivate their friendship or be loyal to them. This uneasy and unequivocal situation is acutely observed by a British official, whom we've already quoted, who was stationed in the Euphrates in the late 1920s, apropos British officials serving with the Iraq government. A.D. MacDonald wrote, The independence which comes from security and the confidence which is the fruit of loyal cooperation towards a common goal, are lacking. The pressure of material circumstances weighs on this descent with little group of Englishmen and robs them of their liberty of thought and action. They turn aside to compromise, chafe at the necessity of doing so, and begin to hate their masters for forcing them into hating themselves. The spirit of enslavement galls and produces in the masters something akin to contempt. These shadows of hatred and contempt are discreetly cloaked over by good manners, but the precipient observed that they are, for all that, present. British prestige declines. To illustrate the make-believe which British policy encouraged in Mesopotamia and to contrast it with the reality, we may set side by side two documents emanating from the same official, Sir Henry Dobbs, who succeeded Sir Percy Cox and preceded Sir Gilbert Clayton as High Commissioner in Baghdad. The first is a draft dispatch, meant for eventual publication, which Dobbs sent to the Colonial Office early in 1927 for their observations and emendations. The draft dispatch tries to make out a case for the British laying down the mandate, and in doing so, makes use of the rhetoric by which such a policy had been advocated and defended. The more we show ourselves disposed to withdraw from Iraq and to foster her advance to real independence, lays down the dispatch with assurance, the greater and more permanent will be our influence in that country. And pressing into use the cadences of the English Bible, it affirms with self-satisfied virtue. So true is it that whoever will save his political influence shall lose it, but whoever will lose his political influence for the sake of right dealing the same shall save it. These were the public and official sentiments maintained against all objections and in the face of the evidence. It is instructive to compare the dispatch with another from Sir Henry Dobbs to the Colonial Secretary, written at the end of 1928. In this later dispatch, which was not meant for publication, the High Commissioner explains that Faisal was imported by the British and had had, had no time to strike roots, that there was little affection for or awe of the Crown, and that there was no national consciousness outside the schools of Baghdad and Mosul, where, as will be seen, the Ministry of Education subjected pupils to intensive indoctrination and no respect for courtiers and politicians. Dobbs went on to affirm that the strength of the Iraq government rested overwhelmingly on British support and on the fear inspired by British aeroplanes and armoured cars. It was not only the High Commissioner and other British officials who were aware of this gulf between things as they really were, and their official and public disguise. The country's official classes, therefore, concluded that the British, in affirming that the Emperor was most splendidly clothed, were either gullible or hypocritical, and in both cases it was useless and dangerous to trust and rely on them. The very bringing of Faisal to Baghdad, then, inevitably entailed for the British consequences ruinous to their prestige. The character of the Iraqi state, which they proceeded to set upon, also involved them in a difficult and unprofitable situation. Iraq was to be a kingdom run on constitutional lines of cabinet and parliament. It was also, for the time being, a British mandate. A constitution had to be agreed and the mandatory relationship to be defined by treaty. It, therefore, became necessary for a constituent assembly to be elected which would promulgate a constitution and ratify the Anglo-Iraqi treaty. Having by a coup de force made the Shiite divines leave the country in 1923, the British thought that all opposition to their schemes were now ended. As Dobbs put it, the completion of the registration of primary electors, which had been before found impracticable, was everywhere carried through with success. The most distant tribesmen of the Euphrates and of the Kurdish hills enrolling themselves with astonishing alacrity. This reaction by the most distant tribesmen of the Euphrates and of the Kurdish hills was perhaps a gratifying but hardly an astonishing reaction to a show of British power. The ensuing elections, such as they were, went smoothly, and in the spring of 1924, a constituent assembly was in being which seemed quite docile and amenable. 
This proved an illusion. A number of deputies led by Yassin al-Hashimi organised opposition to the ratification of the Anglo-Iraqi Treaty and succeeded so well in terrorising their fellow deputies that by the beginning of June, the docile pro-British majority had quite evaporated. On the 4th of June, street demonstrations brought the Assembly to a stop. Ken, Cornwallis and I, Miss Bell wrote that day, agreed that we've made a mistake. It is, we now see, useless to ask a people entirely unversed in politics to take, through its representatives, a vital decision as to its own future. But such a mistake, the British still had the power to rectify. The High Commissioner informed the King that if the treaty was not immediately approved, the Assembly would have to be dissolved the following day. The treaty was approved. The episode may be considered the first coup d'etat to be suffered by the parliamentary system in Iraq. No doubt, the lesson, if they needed to learn it, was not lost on Nuri, Yassin and their fellows, but this was not the only lesson, superfluous as it may have been, which could be learnt, for the British found themselves compelled not only to resort to ultimatums against the Parliament they have called into being, but occasionally to help in the rigging of elections. Thus the British officials at the Ministry of the Interior worked hard in the elections of 1928 to return a pro-government majority. To rig elections to coerce a parliament, to acquiesce in corruption, the British were driven to such shifts by their very decision to transform Mesopotamia into Iraq and to make vital its constitutional king. Not only did the policy they adopted not safeguard their interests, as became clear in 1941 and afterwards, but its very carrying out ruined their prestige and made them wildly mistrusted or hated, and those for whose sake they incurred all this, neither then nor later were able to or willing to stand by their benefactors. Nothing better illustrates the gap between the needs of Mesopotamia and the capacity of its government under the monarchy than the land problem of the South and the manner in which it was tackled. Not less than three-fifths of cultivated and perhaps nine-tenths of ultimately cultivatable land in Iraq, states an official British report, belongs nominally and legally to the state. Such of this land as was cultivated was occupied, sometimes communally, by tribes in various stages of detribalisation. Their title to the land was imperfectly defined. It had no legal sanction and there there existed no land register in which ownership was recorded and boundaries accurately determined and there was potential divergence and conflict between the customary norms of the tribes and the legal norms of the state. In other words, private property, the foundation of modern constitutional government and the indispensable safeguarding its despotism was in a fluctuating state, imperfectly established and easily disputed. The responsibility and power of the Iraqi state in deciding disputes and conferring legal title was enormous and only a stable, impartial, benevolent and far-seeing government or alternatively, government so constituted as to be responsive to the legitimate demands of all sections of the population could successfully tackle this vital problem. Either a chroma or a well-articulated democracy was required. The Fajr regime was neither. To make a satisfactory land settlement, one or two policies seemed possible. The government could try to make use of tribal organisation, which existed on the margin of the state, and out of the tribal sheikhs, make an independent land of gentry, drawing their strength from tribal traditions and practices, which would gradually create a new kind of political life in Mesopotamia, free from the centralising bureaucratic tendencies of the Ottoman regime. This was Miss Bell's vision before she succumbed to the charms of Faisal. The power of the sheikhs, or headmen, she wrote in a wartime paper, was derived neither from the sultans nor from the constitution, nor can it fall with them. It is deeply rooted in the life of the people, and with wise supervision will form, for several generations to come, the staple law and order. But it is doubtful whether such a scheme would have succeeded. Aristocracies are not made by statute some such settlement Lord Cornwallis had attempted in Bengal towards the end of the 18th century, and the result had been the creation of a class of zamindars, who exemplified all the vices of absent and irresponsible landordism. There remains the other alternative, namely that the state should accelerate the process of detribalization, suppress the powers of the sheikhs, and endeavour to create a small, settled peasantry with defined rights and duties which had had been a visible and permanent stake in the land. Such a policy was more consonant with the tradition to the Ottoman officials and with the aims of the Ottoman state since the initiation of the Tanzimat. In the event, neither policy was followed. Nothing was done for the cultivator and the sheikhs became a weapon in the hands of Baghdad politicians to be rewarded or punished according as they supported the winner or loser in Baghdad. When the British occupied the country in order to facilitate administration and keep control of the tribes, they promoted some sectional heads of tribes to paramount rank. The remaining section states the official report for the year 1922-23, to jealous of the position of their quondam rival and fearing, not without reason, that he might use it unfairly, united to oust him, seeking support from any quarter which was thought to be unfriendly to him. The pattern thus established subsisted 
and became ever more permanent as the years went by. The government, able for its monopoly of modern arms to control the tribes as though they had not been controlled for centuries, made use of tribal rivalries and established not an independent landed aristocracy, but a servile clientele of tribal sheikhs who were increasingly compelled to look to the politicians in Baghdad for aggrandizement and enrichment, who in turn found them useful weapons in the struggle for power. The report on 1922-3 already gave an inkling of what was to come. Speaking of the agrarian problems of the Muntafik province, it said, While holding to the principle laid down by officials who have already recently been in supreme charge of the division, namely that good citizens must be judged by their willingness to perform their duty towards the administration, the time is right for Arab statesmen to see that rights and duties are apportioned with justice. A few years later, Sir Ernest Delson, investigating the problems of land tenure in Iraq, noted, administrative caprice overrode the best established prescriptive rights. Possession, he wrote in 1931, is ordinarily nine points of the law, but neither long possession nor any other nodes of acquisition confer security. Personal influence with the most effective arbiter is commonly the decisive factor at any movement in any particular land dispute, and anyone may find the most convincing claims set aside, and as late as 1952, we find a law passed for the land settlement of Amara, which continuing the tradition of absolute administrative discretion in matters of landed property, again vested in the Minister of Finance the ultimate power to determine and assign ownership. Such a development was but taking to its ultimate conclusion the logic of the Ottoman reforms, which tried to found an efficient state on the model of the enlightened absolutisms of Europe which ended in eliminating all local centres of influence, religious, economic or tribal, and making them subordinate to the state. And as is usual in despotism, political power became an avenue to wealth. The ex-Ottoman officers who came to Faisal were obscure upstarts. By the end of the monarchy, they and their descendants had become men of substance. Yasin al-Hashimi's methods to this end, having to do with land, are an opposite instance to cite here. When he was a Minister of Finance from the end of 1926 to the beginning of 1928, a law was passed providing for the distribution of government land to persons undertaking to install irrigation pumps on them. Large estates, declares a dispatch from the United States Consul, were distributed among government officials and their friends. When Yasin died in 1937, he was a large landowner and was said to have acquired 16 estates by means of this law. When the same Hashimi was Minister of Finance in 1933, he had enacted the Notorious Rights and Duties of Cultivators Act, which deprived the fella of all rights and made him into a serf. Under this law, a landowner could evict the fella for any activities deemed harmful to agriculture. On the other hand, the agricultural worker was virtually tied to the land so long as he was in debt to the landowner. It was laid down in the law he could not be employed by another landowner, and should he be dismissed or evicted, his debts were recoverable from his personal property. This law thus transformed a large, perhaps the largest number of Iraqis from free persons into mere adescripti glebi. The utter defenselessness of property in the face of official greed and willfulness appears even more clearly from the sweeping confiscation of Jewish property, which, barely constitutional in form, but certainly unconstitutional in substance, was hustled through a secret sitting of the Parliament in one single day in March 1951. The cabinet which prepared this measure, headed by Nouri al-Sayed, included the Minister of Justice, one eminent jurist, Hassan Sami Tatar. He, in common with other ministers, put his name to the law, and no protest at this despotic subversion of what the state existed to safeguard was made by him or by any other jurist or legislator. This episode presents us with the even more lurid spectacle of the Baghdad Chamber of Commerce, which might have been expected to act as the defender of property, itself cooperating with government in order to facilitate its confiscatory operations. In this, as in so many other respects, the traditions established by the monarchy were merely taken over and extended by its successors. Baghdad reigned supreme over the country. It deposed over parliament which turned out laws at the beginning of ministers. It had an army which, rudimentary as it was, could ye- yet easily overawe the tribes with their ever more primitive rifles, and its civil agents were everywhere, Mutasarifs doing the bidding of the minister, Kuwaim Marams doing the biddings of the Mutasarifs, and Mudirs doing the bidding of Kuwaim Marams. With its monopoly of lawmaking and modern instruments of coercion at its disposal, the state engaged in the world of legislation and administration, laying down rights and duties, and as oil royalties came to swell its purse, becoming well nigh the universal provider of livelihood and prosperity for the populations on whom its rule had been imposed in the name of democracy and self-determination.
As the years went by, the state machine expanded and became top-heavy, while its control was more severely centralised. The regent Abd al was determined that his house should be no more be exposed to the dangers of army interference, of which it had so recently been the victim. Therefore, he who owed his position to the threat of a coup d'etat, in order to tame the army, set out to pursue and punish those officers who had been ready to mutiny on his behalf, but who had subsequently mutinied against him. They were, one by one, caught and executed. The last one was Salah al-Din al-Sabag, who had taken refuge in Turkey and whom the Turks, when the issue of the war was no longer in doubt, handed over to the British, who delivered him up to Iraq. He was hanged publicly at the gates of the Ministry of Defence. This policy, which the army took to be Abdul Allah's own, created fear but also great hatred for the region, a hatred which was at last satiated when the regent's mutated body was in turn hung up in the very same place when Sabag had been displayed. Also to ensure that there would be no repetition of Rashid Ali's attempt, the constitution was amended to give power to the king to dismiss cabinets at his discretion. This increased enormously the influence of the royal court and made Abdul Allah's will the last word in the state. He disliked opposition did not scruple to put down the slightest manifestation of it. In 1950, Muzahim al-Pachiachi, a senator and ex-prime minister, complained in a speech in the Senate that ministers nowadays were so may Temotashi's an allusion to Reza Shah's Slavish minister, and continued, We are afraid to say the truth, which is that there is a limited number of people in Iraq who direct state affairs according to their own wishes. This was taken to be an attack on the regent, and Pachachi was shortly afterwards deprived of his seat in the Senate on the technicality. At a meeting of ministers and political leaders in the royal court in November 1952, an ex-Prime Minister, Taha al-Hashimi, defied those to present to say that a Prime Minister was free to choose his colleagues. The regent became angry and started shouting at Hashimi, denying all responsibility for the distempers of the state, which he put squarely on the political leader's presence. You are all responsible for the situation. You are all liars, he exclaimed. Such then was the state, or to use a term applied to the Ottoman Empire, but known as apt in the conditions of Iraq since 1918. Such were the members of the state institution. From the nature and origin of the Iraqi kingdom, it is clear that they could not be men who represented the principal interests of the country, the Shiites, the Kurds, the Jews, the Christians, the commercial interest or the agrarian interest. The state institution was in fact run to a large extent by members of the same official classes from whom the Ottoman state recruited its officers and civil servants, and the first generation of ministers, politicians and high administrators were themselves ex-Ottoman soldiers and administrators. It was they who established the political and administrative traditions of the new state, and set the pattern to which their successors conformed. These men were not used to the game of politics in a constitutional state. When they had served the Ottoman Empire, they had not been expected to show initiative or accept responsibility. They had been cogs in an administrative and military machine, required to perform as their superiors dictated. When the crust of loyalty to the Ottoman state broke after 1918, they found themselves in an explosive and fluid situation with which they were quite unable to cope. They were also disoriented by the sudden disappearance of the authority to which they had been so long accustomed by the fact that Faisal and his followers had rebelled against the Ottoman state, now occupied all the highest positions in the kingdom. One gets the impression that the senior officers in particular, who had fought until the end in the Ottoman army and who had been recruited into the Iraqi army, found it easy to stage coup d'etat and regard no military discipline with scant respect because they could not bring themselves to consider the Iraqi army to be as real as the Ottoman army in which they had been brought up, and because they had done before their very eyes the lucrative results which had rewarded the indiscipline of their brother officers who deserted to the Sharif. The men of the ruling institution who came with Faisal were the pan-Arab doctrinaires, whose programme and ambitions became the foundation of Iraq's foreign policy. These ambitions chimed in perfectly with the domestic views of Faisal and his house, who were always looking beyond the frontiers of Iraq, seeking to rule over a greater Syria or a fertile crescent. Iraq's foreign policy was therefore a restless quest for prestige and position in the Middle East cockpit. Baghdad became a meeting ground of malcontents from Syria and Palestine and further west, and Iraq subsidised pan-Arab propaganda in the Arabic press on Palestine, Syria and Lebanon. It offered refuge to men like Abdelaziz al Talalibi, at odds with the French in Tunisia, to Abdel Rahman al Shabandar, fleeing from Syria after the 1925 uprising, to Fawzi al Kawuki, a guerrilla leader from Palestine, and to the Mufti of Jerusalem who was in Baghdad from 1939 to 1941. He was voted 
£18,000 by the Iraqi parliament. The Iraqi government paid him £1,000 a month from secret funds, and he received 2% of the salaries of government employees. His men were everywhere, and he became powerful in the land. Iraqi officers also, with the knowledge and connivance of the defence minister and the chief of staff, sent arms to the Palestinian guerrillas when they rose in 1936-39. Ghazi, as has been seen, coveted Kuwait and sought to create a following in Syria. When he died in 1939, his cousin Abd al was imposed as regent by Nouri al-Sayed, then prime minister. Abd al was the only son of Ali, the eldest son of Sharif Hussein, who was very briefly became king of the Hejaz when his father abdicated in 1924. But his abdication, Ali, had at various times hoped to be installed by the French as king of Syria. The son considered himself the heir of his father's throne in the Hejaz, and up to his appointment as regent claimed Hejazi nationality. Thereafter, the Hejaz remained the focus of his ambition, to the detriment of Iraqi-Saudi relations. As late as the mid-1950s, we find him still yearning for the restoration of his house in the Hejaz, and instructing the Iraqi ambassador to Saudi Arabia to look out for Sharifian supporters in the country. Abd al Allah's ambition also extended to Jordan and Syria. After King Abdullah's murder in 1951, he tried to prevent Abdullah's heirs from ascending the throne so that Jordan might be joined to Iraq. As for Syria, from the end of the Second World War to the day of his murder, Abd al Allah may be said to have been obsessed by it. He inspired and instigated active Iraqi intervention in Syrian politics, which in its mischief and danger was paralleled only by the policies which the Egyptians and the Saudis adopted in retaliation. The long duel between Iraq on the one hand and Egypt and Saudi Arabia on the other ended with a decisive defeat for Abd al Allah when Egypt and Syria declared a union in February 1958. On that day, Khalil Khanna, who was a minister under the monarchy, tells us one of Abd al Allah's eyes burst in Fajarat from emotion and vexation. The obsession with Syria may even be said to have directly occasioned the monarchy's downfall, for the Syrio Egyptian Union led to pro Egyptian disorders in the Lebanon which in turn led the Iraqi government to send an armed force to the Syrian and Jordanian frontier. This force, led by Qasim, took the opportunity of its passage throughout Baghdad to carry out the massacre on the 14th of July. This dynastic and doctrinaire pan-Arabism also had its great effects on the educational policy of the kingdom. Schools early became seminaries for political indoctrination. Men like Sati al-Husri, who was later to sing the virtues of Nazi discipline in public lecture in Baghdad, was placed by Faisal in charge of the country's youth, who were taught, early taught how to meddle in politics. Husri's role in the schools were crucial. This ex-Ottoman official combined the cold, centralising passion of the Ottoman bureaucracy after the Tantamut with a rigid, humorless pan-Arabism. This pedagogue may literally be called the recruiting sergeant of pan-Arab ideology, for as he himself said in an address to the Teachers Club in Baghdad in 1934, universal compulsory military training in Iraq, which had been instituted that year, was the most important event to happen in the Arab East, since compulsory education and compulsory military training complemented each other. With Faisal's support, he early became the dominant power in the Ministry of Education, in imposing in educational matters a centralised uniformity on this heterogeneous country and its variegated communities. As he himself tells us in his memoirs, he successfully opposed schemes for opposing teacher training colleges in Mosul and Hilal, when he thought that majority of students would be respectively Christian and Shiite. This, he feared, would lead to the consolidation of a communal spirit among the teachers. He also opposed per capita subsidies to schools established and run by the Jewish or Christian communities because these proposed subsidies, which Jewish or Christian taxpayers might claim as of right, were not conditional and would therefore not give him the power to impose his views and doctrines on these schools. Husri's aim as a pedagogue was, he tells us, to spread faith in the unity of the Arab nation and to disseminate consciousness of its past glories. This was the purpose of his centralising policy of the curricula he devised, the appointments he made, the frequent addresses and circulars by which he attempted to indoctrinate the school teachers. In his memoirs, he gives us a text of a circular he sent to school teachers when he was Director General of Education in 1925. In this circular, he points out, which was in fact the case, that people used the word Arab to mean fella, or Bedouin, and that it is associated in the minds with contempt and mockery. Teachers, whose we lays down, may discourage such usage, they must avoid making such a mistake, and using the name of this great nation, and belonging to which we ought to glory, in this vulgar manner. Teachers have the duty, particularly, to strengthen patriotic and national feeling, and must not use the word Arab in this derogatory sense, either in their lessons or in their conversation. Husri's doctrine was spread in the 1920s and 1930s, zealously and effectively, the more so that behind it were arrayed the resources and the power of a state. 
The popularity and influence of the doctrine just before the outbreak of the Second World War was such that an Egyptian writer could refer to the extreme Husrizism, al Husriya, which we see rampant in Iraq. This writer went on to describe the doctrine and its implications. We mean by Husrism, he wrote, the feeling that to labour for the sake of Arabism requires the adoption of an inimical stance towards non-Arab elements, whether these elements are found within the Arab environment or outside it. This Husrism, which we have seen in Iraq, weakens the Iraqi identity itself since it looks upon Kurds with some hatred and does not desire closer relations with the Iranians or other Muslims who neighbour the territories of the Arabic-speaking peoples. And this cannot be but create problems for the Arab fronts. In his memoirs, Husri also gives details of the history syllabus which he composed for primary schools. The main purpose of the teaching of history in primary schools, he begins by saying, is to impart knowledge of the history of the fatherland and of the nation's past, the aim being to strengthen patriotic and nationalist feeling. al shur al-Watani wal Kaumi in the pupil's heart. The syllabus culminated in the study of Italian unity, Cavour and Garibaldi, and German unity, the Hohenzollern Bismarck. The purpose of such a curriculum is transparent. Italian unity and German unity were the analogues and prefigurations of the current Arab unity. Tentawi, a Damascene school teacher, won the numerous Syrians and Palestinians whom the Ministry of Education began to import in the 1920s in order to preach pan-Arabism to less sophisticated Iraqis, tells us that one of the most fervent wishes of the secondary schoolboys whom he taught in Baghdad in the 1930s while reading the story of Italian unity and German unity was that Iraq should become a Piedmont or a Prussia and thus realise unity with both hands, the hand of the people with its emotions and desires and the hand of the government with its policy and its weapons. The corollary of this indoctrination was that these schools became and were encouraged to become political seminaries, thus those responsible for the riots against the Shias in 1927, when the pro-Umayyad book was published, were treated leniently. The punishments inflicted by the ministry, the official British report informs us, were eventually all remitted, even to the extent of recording free Syrian teachers who were dismissed for publishing in the newspapers a gross insult both to the Minister of Education, who was a Shia, and to the government. The incident and its sequel, the report continued, are ominous. Political and religious agitators have learnt thereby that schools can be stirred up, even on the most childish pretexts, into action which may well result in a breach of the peace. The Ministry of Education must apparently reconcile itself to the fact that in a crisis it cannot trust either the common sense or the loyalty of the teachers. Similar incidents with similar consequences occurred in 1928, when Sir Alfred Mond visited Baghdad, Then an anti-Zionist riot took place of which the nucleus was formed by students of the teachers' training college and of secondary schools. In meeting out punishment for this breach of discipline and good order, observed the British report, the authorities perhaps erred on the side of leniency. It would seem that we may date from this incident the first organisation in Iraq of a political extremism, which drew its strength from the schools and colleges as well as from the army officers. It was then that a number of young men, including Sabahawi, Faik al-Samari, Hussein Jamil, Abdel Qadir Ismail and Aziz Sharif and Khalil Khanna got together in order to de- organise demonstrations against the mandates and against Zionism in Palestine. The situation became much more serious in the 1930s when the attractions of the Hitler Youth and the activities of the Nazi propagandists in Iraq combined to create in students and teachers a heady nationalist intoxication which reached its paroxysm in the Rashid Ali movement. But it is not merely the case that student extremism was the indirect corollary of the politicisation of schools and curricula. On occasion, the government itself directly encouraged students to demonstrate and riot. Thus, Tantawi tells us that when Ghazi was pursuing an active pan-Arab policy one morning, he and his fellow teachers were assembled by the principal of the Central Secondary School and secretly informed that the government desired a demonstration against French rule in Syria and that the teachers were to organise it. A teacher was detailed to each of the ten secondary schools in the capital and made responsible for bringing the students out. When the British occupied Iraq in 1941, they had to install their own men in the Ministry of Education and attempt, of course, in vain to clean it out. The regent himself, in a speech from the throne delivered in 1941, recognised that education in Iraq had been exploited for political purposes and that the youth had been perverted and led astray. But it was the state itself which had been responsible for perverting and leading the younger generations astray. At the time of the Suez affair, the well-known ideologue Abdul Rahman al bazaz himself a product of the regime, was the dean of the law college and he was taken to task by Nuri al-Sayed's government for not curbing student demonstrations in favour of Egypt. His answer to a police official investigation 
student activities against Nuri and the Heshemite regime has in itself something of poetic justice. How, Bazaz asked, can I oppose student strikes in favour of national issues concerning which I entirely share their feelings? In the attempt to prevent students from expressing their sincere and well-behaved Mahad Ahaba feelings in this respect, he affirmed, is vain. It only proves how ignorant the authorities are of the spirit of the age and of the public feelings current in student circles. The culmination of Iraq's pan-Arab policy came in the middle of the Second World War, when Nouri al-Sayed, then Prime Minister, succeeded with British encouragement in setting up the Egypt as principal partner of the Arab League. This enterprise proved a source of endless troubles and intrigues between Egypt and Iraq, who sought each of them to establish their own sole dominance over the other Arab states. In pan-Arab intrigues and and combinations were lost only the Palestine Arabs, but the British position in the Middle East as well. We may therefore say that for Britain, which became involved in the pan-Arab policy, as a result of his pressure and persuasion, Nuri was one of those friends for, from whom one prays to be protected. The Sharifian officers whom Faisal brought with him were, of course, too few to govern the country on their own. As has been seen, they had to share power with the ex-Ottoman officials, who had neither taken part in the Sharif's rebellion, nor had desired secession from the Ottoman state. For these officials who had themselves formed part of the state, the condition of Iraq after 1918 was most unsatisfactory. Once they had helped to rule a state which was the one Muslim great power in the world, now they were confined to a petty kingdom with a Christian power occupied and controlled. This power had, furthermore, brought in a number of obscure men and put them in positions of authority, and these men were claiming that they were the only genuine Arab nationalists, that their uprising had inaugurated a new Arab renaissance, when in fact they had merely been accessories to the humiliation of Islam. The sardonic bitterness of these official classes, without whom Iraq could not be governed, knew no bounds. The clients of British Arab nationalists, they would show them who were the true nationalists. When the Nuri al-Sayed negotiated a treaty with Britain in 1931, his opponents set up a great agitation, claiming that the treaty did not give Iraq true independence, but was merely a diabolic device to subject the country more firmly than ever to British control. In the controversies which ensued, the supporters of Nuri and Jafar al-Askari taunted Yassin al-Hashimi, who was opposed to the treaty, with having done nothing for Arab nationalism. He had not abandoned the Ottomans in mid-war, as the Sharifian officers had done, but fought by their side until the end, and had only changed sides when Faisal was already in Damascus. One of Yassin's partisans, Fahmi al-Mudaris, was moved to reply in these terms. It is not wise, he wrote, to blame his excellency al-Hashimi for having stood firm with the Ottoman army until the last shot had been fired, for his behaviour can be justified on two counts. In the first place, he had the duty as a faithful commander to preserve the army and his own honour. In the second, he believed that the destruction of the Turkish army would lead the Arabs to be delivered over and to submit to the Allies who would divide up their country into zones of influence, which is, in fact, what happened. Seeing what it means to keep faith and what military regulations are, had al-Hashimi abandoned the Turks, he would have included himself in the category of traitors. Again, how did Faisal and his family claim to be leaders of the Arabs and to have saved them from Ottoman despotism? In Ottoman times, people were not used to hear titles such as King of the Hejaz, a title which Sharif Faisal's father had taken to himself. On the contrary, the proudest title of the Ottoman Sultan, on the ruins of whose empire Iraq and so many other countries were built, exclaimed al Mudaris, was that of Kadim al Haramain al Sharifain, the servant of the two holy places of Mecca and Medina. The highest rank in which the sultans gloried was that of sweepers of the holy places. Did they not use the broom as a symbol of their rule? al Mudaris has a passage in which he expresses to perfection an attitude which is encountered again and again among the official classes of Iraq whose Ottoman careers had been ended by the British occupation. Iraq, al Mudaris wrote, never was a Turkish colony. It was part of the Ottoman Empire, which had been independent and autonomous for more than six centuries. Neither was the state Turkish, but Ottoman. This meant that it gathered under its banner different races in the same manner as the Iraq state would today, had it been independent. The Iraqis were not under the yoke of Turkish rule, as they are today under the yoke of the British mandate. They shared, rather in the rule together, with the Turks and the other races, in all the departments of the state. There was no discrimination in rights or duties between the Turks and the Iraqis, and they shared offices, high positions, and the good and the bad equally. The Iraqi exercised rule, justice, administration, and politics for succeeding centuries, not only in Iraq, but in all parts of the Ottoman Empire, which extended to Europe, Asia, and Africa.
from the very foundation then of the Iraqi kingdom, there was this nagging feeling that it was a make-believe kingdom built on false pretenses and kept going by a British design and for a British purpose. This is the origin and explanation of the rabid anti-British feelings of large sections of the ruling class of Iraq, a feeling which persisted until the end and which occasionally exploded in bursts of hatred and violence. The British indeed had few friends in the kingdom they founded. The king and the Sharifian officers who came with him did not dare show gratitude to their patrons, but must always be pressing them for further concessions to make sure cure their own position and prestige. The Shiites and the Kurds felt that they had been betrayed for no good reasons, and further, why should anybody befriend the British when they themselves were so unreliable? Did not the Sharifians operating from Syria raise a sedition against them? In Iraq, where they were no, not really rewarded for their behaviour, Further, though Britain had imposed Faisal on Mesopotamia, yet in their public professions, they kept on insisting that they had been brought him to rule Iraq in response to popular demand, so that they could not even exploit the prestige which comes to governments when they successfully assert their views and impose their authority. As for the non-Muslim minorities, delivered as they were to the Baghdad government, was not the spectacle of the Assyrians enough to frighten them off. The institutions of the mandates, again, were calculated to arouse suspicion in the minds of the Muslim pop- politicians and administrators. Their blunt, uncomplicated minds saw in politics nothing but the exercise of power when they found themselves flanked by British advisers who were supposed to guide their steps and instruct them in the League of Nations' virtues. They were convinced that this was but an underhand manner of undermining their authority and diminishing their power. They were also indignant that Christians and foreigners should presume to teach them who had ruled the country in Ottoman times how to govern. Such was the kingdom which met its doom on the 14th of July of Abdel Karim al Qasim. While the going was good, rulers of Iraq drank from it to satiety as from a bowl of soup, or else used it as a pawn in their dreadful game. The politicians intrigued with the tribes as in the Euphrates uprisings of the mid-1930s, when Yassin al-Hashimi, Hikmat Suleiman and Rashid Ali al Galani secretly suborned tribal chiefs and touched off a long period of tribal unrest. Or again, they debauched the army officers and incited them to mutinies. As when Hikmat conspired with Bakir Sidki or when Nuri al-Sayyid, with those whom he was later to execute from their rebellion in 1941. The world was shocked at Nuri's end, at the demonic hatred which his enemies manifested for him. For Nuri had come to seem in the Second World War, and after the supreme master of Iraqi politics, strong, adroit and straightforward. But Nuri, it must not be forgotten, was before his ascent to the respectable eminence, but one of the many politicians in Baghdad, scrabbling and plotting for power. In the early days of the kingdom, Mr. de Gori tells us, as an extreme Arab nationalist, he went through a picaresque period when he was guarded day and night by a selected gang of toughs, some of the uniform of the Iraqi military police, except for Colonel Joyce, Captain Clayton and me, writes Miss Bell in a letter of the 8th of August 1922. Everyone holds Nuri to be an imp of mischief. As for herself, she confessed that of all the people from the king downwards, there is no one I really love as I love Nuri. It is she who presents the bizarre spectacle of Nuri during the tumultuous debates in the Constituent Assembly on the Anglo-Iraqi Treaty of 1924, going about with a bomb in his pocket designed to encourage supporters of the treaty and no doubt discourage its enemies. In February 1924, Tawfiq al-Khalidi, a senator, ex-governor of Baghdad and ex-minister of the Interior and of Justice, was murdered in the streets in Baghdad. He had been suspected of Republican, perhaps Turkish sympathies, and his murderers were never caught. They are now identified for us as Abdullah Sariya and Shakir al Karakuli, clients of Nuri and his brother in law, Jafar al Askari. It is commonly accepted that the instigators were either or both, and that the aim was to terrorise Faisal's opponents. But this champion of the Sharifian house was also capable of making overtures to its Saudi enemy. After Bakir Sidki's coup d'etat, while in exile in Cairo in 1937, as has been seen, he seems to have offered his services to Ibn Saud to secure for a son of his the Iraqi throne, and this steadfast upholder of the British connection was prudent enough to keep a line open to the Axis. In September 1940, we see him instructing the Iraqi minister in Ankara to seize every opportunity to get in touch with Axis representatives, directly or indirectly, to exhort them to persuade their governments of the utility and necessity of proclaiming their support for the independence of Syria, Palestine and other Arab countries, and to instigate Syrians who might be in touch with the minister themselves to make these approaches and even to visit the Axis capitals. Men who after 1941 were condemned as Nazi agents had early been his friends and coadjutors. The coup d'etat, which he engineered in 1938, succeeded with the help of, among others, the four colonels known as the Golden Square, whom he later executed for their part in the Rashid Ali coup. Rashid had been exiled from Baghdad by the cabinet of Jamil al Midfai, and when Nuri became prime minister, he recalled him and appointed him head of the royal cabinet. 
Salah al-Din of al-Sabah, one of the colonels executed in the consequence of Rashid Ali's movement, was surely justified in saying that it was Nuri, among other politicians, who encouraged the soldiers to assume control over successive ministries. Apart from promoting military disaffection, Nuri helped to further to the debauch the public institutions of the state. It was he whom, when he became Prime Minister in 1930 for the first time in the history of the kingdom, enacted a law which enabled ministers to dismiss civil servants arbitrarily and at their discretion. It may be imagined to what use such a weapon was put by successive Iraqi governments. Again, it was during his ministry that the Futuwa, a semi-military formation of schoolboys modelled on Nazi and fascist patterns, was formed in 1939, and it was he who gave ministerial office in 1940 to Sami Shokat, one of the high officials of the Ministry of Education, most responsible for introducing political fanaticism in the state schools. Again, seeking to avenge the murder of his brother-in-law, Jafar al-Askari, he arrested Hikmat Suleiman and an officer suspected of taking part in the murder, tried them on the trumped-up charge of conspiracy against the state, and had them condemned to death. The British ambassador intervened to prevent the death sentences being carried out. The British occupation of the country in 1941 enabled him to discredit his enemies, weaken his rivals and reign supreme for nearly two decades, presented to the world the picture of an old statesman full of wisdom and uprightness dedicated to progress and reform. This is not at all how the matter looked to his opponents, who considered him a cunning and dangerous enemy, an autocrat in power and an intrigue out of it, and his very skill in manipulating power, and much by any other politicians of his day in Iraq, served but to increase the hate and envy to which, in the end, he fell victim. For this man who rose from obscure beginnings to such a position of power, exemplifies perfectly Machiavelli's man of virtue. Fate presented him with two golden opportunities, which he dared to grasp stoutly and to exploit fully. Once when he deserted from the Ottoman army and threw in his lot with the Sharif, and again when he ranged himself by the side of Britain in 1941. His bloody end was a fitting conclusion to a life lived dangerously. He was caught in a Baghdad street, disguised as a woman, and killed on the spot. His body was reduced immediately to a pulp by the wheels of innumerable motor cars joyously driven over it. In this horrible death, the fated reenactment of a rite which Baghdad's sombre and unappeasable genius seems now and again to exact. It is, in any case, the uncanny echo of another such death which took place in 1763. In that year also, the Janissaries rose against the Wali. He also tried to flee disguised as a woman, was recognised as one of the, at one of the city's gates, and immediately executed. Over a century ago, an unknown citizen of Baghdad kept a diary in which he recorded with a sceptical and jaundiced pen the misdeeds, the peculations, the intrigues and the murders of the rulers of the, in his day. In this grisly spectacle, which seems to repeat itself in Baghdad every decade and every century, and to have seen which in itself is kind of bruised and fallen glory, one actor who had his brief moment of power may stand as a symbol for the rulers of this wretched country. This man who flourished was Ali Riza al Laz, was Vali from 1831 to 1842, started as a small clerk in a village al Khalis, and he grew to become one of the most powerful men in Baghdad. His greed and cruelty, says the chronicler, knew no bounds. To retell them would fill many volumes, and the compiler would be accused of lying and exaggeration. The notables of Baghdad, among whom were numerous men of learning and piety, were terrified of him and did not dare complain to the Vali. Yet who, but for this chronicler, would have remembered this terrible man? The diarist knew him as Mullah Ali al Qasi, Mullah Ali the eunuch, and adds that it was not even known whether he was a eunuch or not. Of his circumstances we know nothing, neither his father's name nor his mother's, whence he came of wherever he went, only this, that he had power for twelve years and then fell. It is a consoling thought that perhaps today, in circumstances no less sombre than those of previous centuries, there may still be in Baghdad a private person, uncorrupted by ministers of guidance and ministers of education, to chronicle in secret with an unlettered and literal pen the doings of the Mullah Alis of his day.